The federal government finally issued its response to the financial system inquiry, accepting the overwhelming majority of its recommendations and adding six additional measures. Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull and Assistant Treasurer Kelly O'Dwyer said the government's financial system program is based around five distinct strategic priorities, these being resilience measures aimed at reducing the impact of potential future financial crises, superannuation and retirement incomes measures to improve the efficiency and operation of the superannuation system and boost retirement incomes, innovation measures to unlock new sources of finance for the wider economy and support competition, consumer outcomes measures to give consumers the confidence to participate in the financial system knowing that they'll be treated fairly, and regulatory system measures to make regulators more accountable for their performance, more capable and more effective. In the consumer outcomes area, improving financial advice and making financial product issuers more accountable will be key priorities, with the government proposing to introduce a new ASIC product intervention power that could be used to modify or ban products. Remuneration structures will again be under scrutiny, this time in life insurance, stockbroking and mortgage broking, to ensure they don't adversely affect the quality of advice consumers receive. With inflation remaining lower than expected and low interest rates supporting borrowing and spending in the Australian economy, the RBA left the cash rate unchanged at 2% at its November board meeting. The RBA's Governor, Glenn Stevens explained in a statement on the decision that moderate expansion in Australia's economy continues, with a gradual improvement in conditions over the past year, accompanied by strong growth in employment. The recent changes to housing lending rates by banks may put a dampener on borrowing. However, Stevens highlighted that supervisory measures are in place to contain risks in the housing market. Figures from the ABS showed the CPI rose just 0.5% percent in the September quarter, slowing from an increase of 0.7 percent in the June quarter of 2015. The most significant price rises this quarter were seen in international holiday travel and accommodation, fruit and property rates and charges, falls in vegetables, telecommunication equipment and services and automotive fuel partially offset these rises to result in a small increase overall. The CPI rose 1.5 per cent through the year to the end of September, with this measure remaining steady from the previous quarter. Turning to international news, as the pressure of expectation around the first US interest rate rise in nine years increases, the US Federal Reserve opted to keep rates on hold again at its October meeting. With economic activity continuing to expand at a modest pace, commentators have regarded the absence of warnings about global economic and financial developments as a signal that a rate increase may be imminent, perhaps as soon as the Federal Reserve's December meeting. The Fed outlined that it will consider both realised and expected progress towards its objectives of maximum employment and 2% inflation when making a decision at its next meeting. Looking to Europe, slowing inflation to below the 2% medium term target rate has been cited as a key factor in the ECB's decision to keep key interest rates on hold when its governing council met in Malta in October. While real GDP growth in the euro area was 0.4% in the second quarter of 2015, driven by both domestic demand and exports, with a similar pace of growth expected in the third quarter, the ECB is still concerned about the outlook for emerging market economies, which could have a negative impact on exports. China's interest rates have reached a record low of 4.35%, and the deposit rate ceiling for savers has been removed, as the country struggles to combat deflation inflationary pressures and kickstart the economy. The moves came as new data showed growth of the Chinese economy had slipped below 7% to 6.9% in the three months to the end of September, a 25-year low. While the cut to the benchmark bank lending rate was the sixth in the last year, the removal of controls on deposit rates that banks can pay savers is indicative that the People's Bank of China is now considering deeper financial reforms, which some commentators believe will be necessary to revive China's economy. In other domestic news, 
ASIC has made changes to its market integrity rules to regulate warrants and ETFs admitted for quotation on CHIEX, Australia's new investment product market. CHIEX plans to launch the new market in late 2015, beginning with the quotation and trading of warrants, followed by the launch of ETFs in 2016. ASIC emphasised that the changes to the market integrity rules were necessary to ensure a consistent regulatory framework is in place for those trading warrants and ETFs. ETFs on the CHIEX and ASX markets. ASIC also recently released its market integrity report for the period of 1 January to 30 June 2015 in Rep 450. In the report, the regulator outlined its ongoing enforcement focus areas in market integrity, which are cyber resilience, confidential information and conduct risk. ASIC has completed two new reviews to analyse the impact of high frequency trading on Australian equity and futures markets and dark liquidity on equity markets. Rep 452 found that overall, financial markets users have become better informed and equipped to operate in an electronic and high-speed environment environment and negative sentiment about high frequency trading has reduced. ASIC also observed that sentiment about dark liquidity has also become more positive and in particular the transparency and fairness of market participant operated crossing systems. However, ASIC remained concerned about exchange market and crossing system operators seeking to give preference to some users over others, as well as the methods used to manage conflicts of interest for principal trading and client facilitation. With a change to the return not necessary rule coming into play this year, the ATO has reminded SMSF trustees that all funds registered on or after 1 January 2015 must lodge an annual return. All SMSFs are now required to lodge a return in their first year, regardless of the assets they hold or if a nil tax assessment is expected.